For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The greatest of gifts from the greatest of givers. Sacrifice for the sake of salvation. The sinless given to rescue sinners. The greatest hope for those trapped in the prison of hopelessness. The gift of the Son of God who would reveal the love of God to a lost world. The gift that would make it possible for humanity to be reconciled to God. The gift of mercy. The gift of the gospel. The one gift so great that it inspires the recipients of the gift to become givers of the gift. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. Welcome again to Hope Church. We're excited that each one of you can be here today to worship Jesus with us. It's an exciting day because, well, it's almost Christmas. So if you're a parent right now, eight days is coming quickly. Uh, If you're a child right now or a teenager, uh, you're just so excited because you don't really have to do a whole lot, and it's coming really quickly, (laughs) okay? So it's happening. Um, But listen, I I love Christmas time. I love the festivities. I love, you know, everything from the gifts to the decorations to all that comes along with it. It's it's a lot of fun, and it's just neat to see society as a whole kind of come around to do festive things together. Um, But even when it comes to the gifts and everything else, it's fun to receive, it's fun to give. Uh, But the most important gift goes without saying is Jesus Christ. And we know that, we say that. Of course, we're going to say it a hundred times within these sermons in these couple weeks that we're going through this. Um, But Jesus is our gift. And the idea of receiving Jesus, and many of you had received Jesus years and years ago, but the idea of receiving him is to re-gift him and to give him to someone else. And the greatest part about this gift is you get to keep it. You can give him away, but you get to retain that which you had to begin with. And so that's why we're talking about the idea of a son being given, and therefore the things that he has given to us, we then can give back. And so uh, we look in Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You're probably going to hear some songs that uh, derived around this passage. And the idea simply is that hundreds of years before Christ came, the Messiah came, It was prophesied that he would be born. There would be a savior. He would be born. He would come and he would do all kinds of things. Now, then we read in in John and just making connection. And and we're looking at each these two verses at the beginning of each message. But John 3, 16, uh, God loved the world uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How much did he love us enough to send his son to die for us. And we make the connection from the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Christ came, into the New Testament, realizing that a son has been given and that God gave that only son. His name is Jesus. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about love. Uh, through Jesus, he gave us love. And so then we give love to somebody else and to everybody else that we possibly can. Last week, we talked about reconciliation, talked about, we we entitled it the great exchange, um, but dealing with the fact that we've been given that ministry and message of reconciliation to then be able to give to other people as well. And today, we're going to talk about mercy. Mercy, really simple, uh, simple title if you want to leave it there, but dealing with the idea of mercy. We've been given mercy, so we're going to give mercy away. Now, how does that, what is the definition and what is mercy exactly? Let's kind of go through this. The definition would be compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Okay, I'm going to repeat it. Compassion or forgiveness shown toward someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. From a human level, this would be the benevolent or compassionate treatment of someone suffering or in need, and even specifically, an enemy. That is who we would have mercy upon. From the divine level, it is the foundation of forgiveness expressed in God's pardon of human sin. 
as we looked at even last week with reconciliation, looking at us as aliens or enemies to God. And yet, He gave us reconciliation today, yet He's giving us mercy. Now, if we were to go to both the Hebrew and the Greek, and you wanted to track down all the words that are used, there's actually quite a few, uh, kind of like love, where there's multiple words used for love. In this case, there's three, at least three words used in the Hebrew and the Greek. There's about three words used as well. And um, to kind of summarize, if I were to give you like an overarching definition without going into every one of the words and all their distinctions and so forth, I would simply say this, to show favor or an act of kindness to be gracious, to be merciful, to show compassion, to be generous toward, to show steadfast love. It's one of the Hebrew words used, which is really kind of powerful there. And to forgive. And the connection of forgiveness comes especially into the New Testament. So I'm going to take you real quick and just giving you sort of a baseline on mercy. But I want to take you to Psalm 51 and verse 1. And just looking at this passage, it actually shows multiple words here. Uh, in the Hebrew. And so you see, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. If you don't know Hebrew, there's three different words for, for mercy in this verse. Okay? The very first one, have mercy on me, is one. Steadfast love is actually another. And then abundant mercy is yet another. Three words in this one verse. That's used for mercy. And so the way David's saying it sounds completely different than the way you and I are reading it because he's giving those nuances and different words for mercy there. If I take you to a New Testament uh, passage, it would be Luke uh, chapter 1. Uh, the long, one of the longest chapters there is in Luke 1 and going all the way down to 76 through 78 where it says this, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy, there it is, of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us on high. And you see the idea there, uh, the tender mercy. um, And that word tender and the word mercy are two different words for mercy. Again, you don't really see that in the English, but just understand that. So I showed you three in Hebrew, and there's two in Greek. You saw it all in English. Uh, but the point is, you see the way these words play out. And they're all over the place. Hundreds of times in the Bible. This is not like some small occurrence, and we can, we can make an easy theology of this. If we were to really go and study mercy throughout all of Scripture, it would take us way more than today. Certainly way more than these 30 minutes, uh, but a whole lot longer to cover And so when we deal with mercy, we're dealing with the character of God. I think a good passage to look at in in that's going to be in Psalm and uh, one Psalm 145. And we'll look at verses eight and nine. So Psalm 145, verse eight says this, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. A couple of words you saw there, if you can remember from the other one there. The Lord is good to all and His mercy is over all that He has made. You see, this is like along His character. This is who He is. Just like God is love, you know, God is merciful. And this, He bestows this upon whomever He chooses. Romans chapter 9 and verse 15, it says this. For He says to Moses, quoting from Exodus, by the way, He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on on whom I have compassion. So is it an accident that God has mercy on everybody? Not at all. When he sent his son Jesus, he had mercy on everybody. And there's instances where he has mercy on a nation or mercy on an individual and seemingly not on others. He will choose whom he has mercy on, which should make us super excited because he chose to have it on you and me. This, where this comes from, from Exodus 33, and we're not going to really go there in Exodus 33, but in Exodus 34... Um, is an interesting thing that takes place talking about God. Moses is, is uh, being able to see what I like to call the after effects of God going by, so to speak. You know, It's where God sh- hides him with his hand as he goes by. And then as all the clouds and everything swirl around afterwards and he sees, so to speak, even the backside of the Lord, this is what he hears. Verse 6, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, and just listen to this, The Lord capital L-O-R-D is Yahweh. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, 
The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. You know, the words that he chooses to use first about himself is mercy and grace. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. And now he's defining it, really. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. By the way, before I continue reading, do you realize this all is within the name of God? The whole, the whole thing. This, this is two verses in the Lord, the Lord, verse 6, that God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. All that was said about who God is, His name even, as He passed by and Moses heard. You can imagine the rocks trembling, the mountains shaking at this moment. You can imagine Moses can't even look up to see anything because this is just absolutely too awesome for him to do so. But the very first words he says is about mercy. And so when we think about mercy, uh, we have to realize that mercy is best seen on those who greatly need it. Mercy is best understood when looking at someone who is sinful, when looking at someone who is disobedient. And God's mercy encourages us to repent and to return to Him. God's mercy is found in one man. And of course, y'all know where I'm going with this. It's found in Jesus Christ. Because the whole idea of Him coming to die for mankind is that He came to show and to have mercy on you and I. It was, it was our gift of mercy is Jesus. You know, His gift, His mission, His message is mercy and being merciful to others. And so what I want to do is I want to take you to a passage where we'll spend most of the rest of the time, so we're not going to be hopping around like we've already done this morning. And we're going to go to John, the end of John chapter 7. Uh, but as we're going there, we're going to look at one specific example. There are many. We could look at multiple. That's what's very difficult about choosing. Which place do we go to? Which passage do we camp out at? Because there's so many places we could go to talk about the mercy of Jesus. But this, I think, says it maybe better or, or best in a lot of ways. And so I want to go to this passage. The funny part about it is the word mercy does not appear. But the concept is absolutely throughout. And you'll get it. Because I did, and it's here. It's clear. All right, so we're reading from John chapter 7. In verse 53, you're going to see just a little portion there, okay? You need to remember when reading your Bible that the Bible was not written in verse and chapter subdivisions, okay? That came uh, thousands even of your hundreds of, of years later, okay? And these subdivisions and such were to keep it so that we could say to one another, hey, let's talk about, in this case, the woman caught in adultery. Well, where was that at? Well, it's in the book of John. I don't really know. I think it was toward the beginning. I don't really... Now we can say it's John chapter 8. We can say clearly so we can simply pull it open and have it. But in this section here, uh, John chapter 7 verse 53 is the section that belongs to John chapter 8 verse 1 and the rest of the chapter. And here it is right here. They went each to his own house. Now you're done with chapter 7. And we're heading on to chapter 8. But I had to give that to you because chapter 8 it begins with but Jesus. Okay, They all went to their own house. But what did Jesus do? He went to the Mount of Olives. Okay, now we've got it. Now we understand why we went to chapter 7, verse 53. He went to the Mount of Olives. And it says, I'm going to read just a few verses here. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Oh, man. Aren't you glad you're not Jesus at this very moment, right? Don't have to answer or deal with this type of difficulty and problem because he's between a rock and a hard place by the law, by what the Roman government had, lots of things. And we'll address that in a moment. The phrase, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives is really interesting because it's reminiscent of the pattern that Jesus had in that week leading up to his death. Um, he would spend nights in Bethany. He would then travel to Jerusalem each day. And there's various passages where he would pause and stop off at the Mount of Olives. Now, what do you think he'd be doing at the Mount of Olives? 
what he, what he did a lot of times. He'd be off praying, talking to God, connecting with God um, in, in all those ways there, looking ahead at the week to come, all the things he would go through. Um, but it says, early in the morning he came to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Now, how many of you, I just kind of want to know this, how many of you are morning people? Anybody? Just be honest. I'm not going to call you up, I'm not going to embarrass you, okay? How many of you are certainly not morning people? Raise your hand. Man, there's a lot more of those, okay? Maybe that's why I'm your pastor, because I'm like, wake up in the morning, hey, it's time to go, it's a great day, let's just get this done, you know? Um, I love mornings, I love waking up, it's a new day, the greatest part about a morning is everything that happened the day before could be looming underneath you and behind you, but it's over with, today's a new day, you get to do new things, okay? So we can address the days of today today. Um, but it, the things of today, today. Anyway, what I always think about, it, I love this verse because it says, they all came to him, they sat down, and they taught him. Now, you, if you know me, you've been around me long enough, you know that I like to sit and think about the way things happen, right? So you got to picture this in your mind. What does it look like? Is this like six people sitting beside Jesus and, you know, kumbaya, my Lord, you know, kind of thing? This is, this, there could be hundreds of people gathered around him, all right, what do you think is going to be around a bunch of people that have gathered early, early in the morning? Answer, coffee. What else would you have? Now, I'm being sarcastic because they didn't even have coffee back in that day to my knowledge. But anyway, um, the, the point is, if this was me picturing, how would this be if Jay Smith got to sit with Jesus Christ? In the morning, early in the morning, before everybody else got a chance to get up. And we're just, he's going to sit and teach. What better way to spend a morning than just to listen to the words of Jesus over a cup of coffee? You know, maybe a biscuit, DJ from Bojangles, right? Um, or something like that. And yeah, you know, I'm being sarcastic. Of course, that probably didn't happen. But how about the catch of the morning? Likely, you had some fishermen that got off the Sea of Galilee and came out there they probably had some fish. They probably had some homemade bread. You know, and, and as they sat there and ate and communed with Jesus, they sat and learned from the master creator God, their Savior, who was about ready to give his life up for them. Man, what an awesome morning. That, that's, that's to set the stage, okay? Everything seems so well. You know? And so I, I ask this question to you now in light of that. What are you doing right now in your life not at this moment, this may be a piece of it, okay? But what are you doing right now in your life to learn about Jesus? What are you doing in your life to grow deeper in your knowledge of Him? Is the podcast that you're listening to? Are there some books that you're currently reading? Is there a devotional series that you're going through? Something Christmas-oriented at this time of the year? You know, what is it for you? And the hope is that you have an answer for that. But listen, you may not. Matter of fact, if you don't, you're probably going to join 95% of the people in this room and everybody else in this world that don't really have a segmented, planned out way of studying Scripture and growing closer to Jesus. Can I encourage you to no longer be that way and to find a way to connect with Him and find a way to learn and grow from Him? If you're not a morning person, do this at night. There's nothing in the scripture that says, thou shalt every morning at 530 get up and read thy Bible. You know, it doesn't say that, okay? So make it what you are. The one quarter of you who are like me, make it the morning. Wake up, get your cup of coffee, make it a good cup. Don't drink none of that nonsense. And, and be able to study scripture and get closer to Jesus. If it's you in another way, the 75% of you, go elsewhere and find a way to connect with him. What we see in this passage, though, as we look forward, the Pharisees are going to bring a woman in the middle of this. Now, again, you imagine with me, right? They're, they're enjoying their time, maybe, like I said, the fish, the catch of the morning, uh, the, some bread, or just simply sitting around one another, bowl of Fruit Loops, and, and just being able to talk with Jesus and listen to Him. And then this mob comes in with this woman and we'll, we'll address her in a moment, but this mob comes in and completely interrupts the scene. Now, this just reminds me, years ago, my uncle, he's a pastor now, uh, but years ago, I remember, I was probably in high school at the time, and we just were driving in the car, doing something on his farm. I can't even remember where we were at the moment, but he told me this, and, and it always stuck with me. He said, one-third of everyone that you speak to, he was talking about one day me being able to do what I'm doing right now. I didn't even know one day that I would do that at that time. But he said, one-third of those that you'll speak to 
are interested and invested and want to learn. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's cool. That, that's a good thing. And then he said, one third of them are just there. And then he said, one third don't care at all, is what he said. They'd rather go eat something, uh, go be somewhere else, or thinking of something else. And I'm telling you, that stuck with me. Before I ever took a first class in college or dealt with anything regarding being a pastor, I always thought to myself, yeah, I'm going to have one third of the people are really going to be interested. One third are there. My hope is to get the, that one third to kind of be interested. And the other third, well, they kind of checked that before they came in. But anyway, um, that's kind of where it's at. You see the same thing actually taking place right here. Now, I don't know all the details, and I'm assuming a little bit in the mix here, but you've got a bunch of them who met, out, met Jesus early in the morning. They were out there early. They want to learn for sure. You've got some of those that probably were dragged along, that they're there, and I would imagine listening to Jesus teach that they're getting engaged or going to find a way to get engaged. And then you've got the Pharisees that come in toward the latter part, and you know what? They don't care that Jesus is teaching. They don't care what he's teaching. They're going to be rude about it. They, don't, they really could give a flip. They're just going to come in there and completely interrupt what's going on. And they do it. They're rude. They're interrupting. It indicates their hearts uh, in, in this situation. And it kind of reminds me, as, as I'm thinking about that, it reminds me of doing our devotions with our kids. You know, we've been trying to read through the book of Luke. Um, and, and if you start on the first and you read one chapter, guess what? Well, you finish Luke at 24 the day before Christmas. That seems to work, right? Unless you're like us, and on chapter 8, um, on the 17th, of, and, and we got about 2 to 3 to read tonight, and then 2 to 3 to read tomorrow, you know, and try to catch up a little bit here, because we've fallen behind. But as I sit down, and, and we're reading even last night, it's kind of comical, because in the Smith house, okay, here we are, we choose to do this around the fireplace, and, and we've got the, we got the L-shaped couch, and I'm sitting on a chair, and my wife, and, and, and one of my daughters is sitting by the fire, and the other three are cuddled up and laying on the couch, of course, Gideon kind of he was all over the place for the first little bit, um, but that's Gideon, you know, and then you got to add two more things to this, a big dog and a little dog. Remember I told you about those dogs? Yeah, yeah. So the big dog and little dog don't care about this Bible study at all, okay? They, they just don't, and Dallas is, <laughs> you know, going around every which way and jumping all over everybody. He is the, the distraction. Now, I've done one thing right in training my dog. This is not in my sermon notes, okay? I'm just telling you all this. I've done one thing right in training my dog, and it was this. Down. And he does it. In the middle of the chicken coop, with chickens running all around him, okay? The dude's got it. That's the only thing he does right, but he does it. And so I look at him, and, and I normally don't do it right away. i got to get better at this thing. But after about reading four, five, six verses or whatever, and Dallas is <laughs> all over everybody and doing all kinds of things. Uh, Dallas, here, down. And he just plants right down on the ground. I tell him to stay. And, of course, then the little dog, right after that, as I go into the next few verses, is, and she's like, you know, they're hyper, you know, that's how they are. And they're all over the place, and she's jumping all over and jumping all over. And the kids, I'm, I'm trying to read, but I'm distracted while I'm reading this thing, you know. And then all of a sudden, I just look over, I stop, I grab the dog, and I walk over to the couch, and I set her next to my wife, <laughs> you know. Hold her, please. <laughs> This is a distraction, you know. Anyway, what I'm dealing with and what I'm trying to say is this is sort of the scenario. Jesus, we don't know what he was teaching. The text doesn't say at all. Was it on eschatology? Was it when he would return? Is it dealing with some form of how you love your neighbor? We'd have no idea what he's actually going through at this moment. Uh, but what we know is that it was important and that it was interrupted, okay? Now, I'm not going to take away from the interruption because this interruption has stood the test of time for 2,000 years for you and I to be able to look back at and learn from. And so it's, it's even the interruptions God can use, right? And he does in this case. And so here we are then in verse um, 3. The scribes, the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. I had to stop right there. How? Okay, I'm, I think we need to stop picturing all that that happened there. How did that happen? In terms of how did they get caught? Who caught them? Who was waiting behind? You know, there's lots of scenarios here. The other thing you've got to understand is where's the guy? We're going to address that here in a little bit. But where's he? I mean, if she was caught in the act of adultery, she was with a man. Right? 
So what did he do? Run fast and they couldn't catch him? They have no idea who he is? They didn't see his face? It doesn't say, but there's a lot of, and this is my personal opinion. I'm going to tell you when it's my opinion. It's my personal opinion. There's a lot of foul play going on with whoever this man is. Potentially even a Pharisee? We don't know. Okay? And so I want you to picture this woman. She's caught in adultery. What is she wearing? Probably a blanket. Probably a shawl. Probably naked underneath. And, and just you know, trying to hold herself together and cover herself. They've grabbed her. They've pulled her from this bedroom, wherever this took place. And they've dragged her into this place. She is completely alone, completely embarrassed. She's humiliated. She's on the ground. The text doesn't go into it. But you know she's got to be bawling her eyes out. Completely, utterly humiliated and embarrassed and scared. Because now everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to find out. Mom and dad, my kids, my spouse, everybody's going to know what I did. And she's laying there on the ground. At this moment in her life, nothing else mattered but getting through that moment. Ever been there? Maybe not that exact same situation, but where nothing else mattered but just getting through. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees, they'd already gathered stones because if you'll recall in the story, they don't go around picking them up. They've already got them in their hand, ready to throw them, ready to do exactly what they've set out to do. They wanted to make a judgment on her. Now, I need to be clear on something. Adultery is wrong. This is a sin, okay? She was deserving of judgment. Just like you and I, when we disobey our parents, teenagers, we're deserving of judgment. When, when we call our boss a foul name, we're deserving of losing potentially our job. When we don't do certain things in our life and when we act in certain other ways in our life and we're actually wrong, we are wrong for those things. And guess what? We also are deserving of judgment. And without a shadow of a doubt, she deserved judgment here. But the penalty, this specific penalty, is death. The Bible actually is very clear about this. I'm not going to go to the passages, but in Leviticus 20.10, in Deuteronomy 22.22, the Scripture is very clear when it says that the male and female caught in adultery shall be stoned. But you'll notice the fact that it was the male too, which I pointed out. Where is he? Why didn't they grab hold of him? So Jesus had a little bit of ammunition there if he wanted to use it. We don't have everybody present. He could have gone that route, you know, if he wanted to be a politician or something like that at the moment. Um, but it didn't have everybody. Both were to die. But how did he get away? Was it a setup? Was he another religious leader? They both were in the wrong. But at this moment, the only one present was the girl. I don't know why. I can't go into it. I can only speculate. But we do know they were trying to trap Jesus without a shadow of a doubt. Verse 6 says this, then they, this they said to test him. So I didn't lie to you. There it is. It's a trap. They said it to test him um, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now, they were going back here and talking about this and dissecting these few verses. They were trying to trap Jesus. If he had condemned her at that moment, he would have satisfied the small crowd. Okay? He would have satisfied the mob who'd come out there. They would have justifiably, in a way, they would have justifiably stoned this woman for the act which she had committed. Now, now when I say that, I need to be clear on another thing. We have to realize the severity of sin of any sort. It's easy to point our finger at someone who does something horrible or who does something where everybody knows about it. But then the thoughts that you've had in your mind, you ever thought about killing somebody before? I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But I would almost guarantee that everybody in this room has thought about it before. That is a horrible thing to admit to. Okay, but guess what? You've probably done it. All right? Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Have you ever said something wrong to somebody else? Have you ever lied about something? Because guess what? You are deserving of 
judgment based on what you've done. Sin is horrible. We're not overlooking that. Jesus, in this passage, does not overlook sin. Mercy has nothing to do with overlooking sin. It's the complete opposite. Mercy sees how horrible the sin is, how horrible off the person will be. Mercy sees all the judgment and everything and says, but I will love you through it. That's what mercy says. It's different. And so all this, I want you to know though, that if he had condemned her to death, there's another part of the story that you don't really see in the text. And that is that it would have infringed on the exclusive rights of the Roman prefect. They were the only ones alone who could execute. And how do we know that? We know that from Jesus with Pilate. Because it ended up happening there that it it states, I think it's John 19, but it states this. It's not lawful, quote, for us to put anyone to death. And that's why the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate. Okay? So here's the thing. There there are things that they were doing, the ways that they would punish people, um, the ways in which they would obey the Old Testament over serious sins like this, they couldn't even do. So they were trying to pin Jesus with, with their words. You need to obey the Old Testament, Jesus. But if you do this, the Roman government's going to kill you, okay? That's what they're saying. And so once again, Jesus is in between a rock and a hard place, and Jesus does what only he seems to be able to do, and amazingly enough, says just the right thing at just the right time, and it is amazing. So he begins to write, all right? And, and, and it says in the middle of verse 6, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Can you picture this again? You know, you see all this mob that's come out, the, you know, the coffee's been spilled, and lots of problems have happened, and all this is going on. But in the middle of that, this woman's crying in the middle, and Jesus, probably right next to her, right near her, just reaches down on the ground and begins to write with his finger. What's he writing? You know, there's been so much speculation about that that I'm not even going to give an answer to this, okay? There's so many things that people would say, and the bottom line is that the text doesn't say what he's writing. We have no idea what he's actually writing. Tradition will state all kinds of things. Other people will speculate. Um, But ultimately, they still, even after whatever it is he wrote, they're still questioning. It says in verse 7, as they continue to ask him while he's writing, whatever it is, drawing a picture, stick figure, if it was me, you know, whatever it is that he's actually doing on the ground, as they continue to ask him, he stood up and he said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Wow. Because in that statement, Jesus dealt with the heart of the matter in the Old Testament. He dealt with the result that didn't need to be done so that he wouldn't have to deal with the Roman prefect. Okay? And he completely dissipated the mob that had come against this woman. Who is without sin? Not a soul. Nobody. By the way, they're holding the rocks. Tell us what to do, Jesus. We'll go ahead and throw it now. It's time, okay? They're ready to do this. But he says, which one of you wants to start it off? How about the person who doesn't have any sin and can go ahead and say to this woman, I've never done anything wrong, so I'll be the one to judge you. And one by one, they begin to drop the stones. And put them down. I find it very interesting. It actually says, beginning with the older ones. Why is that? Because they sinned more. Okay? They knew. They understood. They were a bit wiser in this scenario. They got me. I'm not going to be the one to do this. It'll be somebody. I'll pick my stone back up if somebody starts this thing. But I'm not going to start it. And the older ones drop it. They begin to back off. You know, and he's continuing then in verse 8. He's continuing uh, to write down whatever it is he's writing. But they're not leaving based on what he wrote. They're leaving based on what he said. Which one of you doesn't have a sin? When we deal with somebody right now in our lives, and we're working with people that have, that have fallen into whether it's a deep sin or whether it's an addiction or whether it's some kind of horrible problem in their life that they're having to face, it is so easy to pick up that stone and say, you are A, and throw it. It's too easy to do that. We're all super guilty of doing that. And yet, Jesus says, but you've got sin of your own. You need to have mercy. Because that person, yeah, 
They're failing right now. Yes, they've done wrong. Absolutely, that is a sin. But Jesus says, I love them, and I love you, who also is a sinner, who also is deserving of judgment and death and so forth. Whoever is without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. So as they all walk away and they all end up leaving, the end of verse 9 says Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Verse 10, Jesus stood up to her and, and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. Now, coming back to this, when Jesus says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? He has to ask the question, Where is everybody? Because I imagine that her face is deep down in the ground with her hands over her eyes, with crying tears everywhere, hair matted up, trying to again keep herself together and clothes so people won't see her nakedness. Embarrassed and all this going on. And she probably hears people begin to walk away, but she's just waiting for that first stone to connect with her body. It'll be a painful one for sure. And the ones that follow will hurt, but it'll come a time where she won't feel anything anymore. That's got to be what's going through her mind. And then Jesus says, where is everybody? <laughs> Can you imagine her peeking through her, her fingers, lifting her head up and looking one direction, looking back around the other direction, realizing they're all gone. I mean, she went there the whole way knowing that she was going to be stoned, figuring this was her last moment in life. Everything was going to be bad. She was going to die. But she, he said, has no one condemned you? The only thing she can say is nobody. Nobody has. To which Jesus says, neither do I. I'm glad that Jesus chose to be merciful not just to her, but to me. And that he can say to me, he doesn't condemn me. Because as I read in Romans, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. It's me. I'm in the story. And so are you. Every one of you, as we've realized that he has laid down his life for us, no more condemnation. But with that message, from now on, quit sinning. Don't go down this road anymore. Whatever it is that you know that you're doing that's wrong, quit it now. Take an inventory of your life right now. Each one of you, where are you at in life? You're not going to answer out loud. This is just between you and God. What have you done wrong? How have you wronged God? And what is it that's holding you back? There's not a soul in this room that can't name something in their own heart to God. What is the sin? What are the sins, plural? Which ones are holding you back? Which ones does Jesus need to be merciful to you over? Which ones are you or should you be condemned over? And you think and you name that sin, whatever it is, it's in your heart right now, it's in your mind, you know what it is. Be like this woman when Jesus says to him, I got mercy for you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you this compassion. When you deserve judgment, I'm going to give it to you. But from here on out, don't do it anymore. A lot of people will say that Jesus didn't condemn this woman or didn't say to this woman that she was wrong. Oh yeah, he said she was wrong. It's clear. Don't sin anymore. You're done. This sin, we're not going to have this meeting again. Don't interrupt next Saturday's coffee and, and Bojangles, okay? It's not going to happen again, okay? Don't do it. But above and beyond that, look at every other area of your life and realize everything that you've done wrong, you need to deal with it and to deal with people in your life that have these issues and these problems. So we got to deal with our own sin, but we also have to deal with other people. In order to deal with... Uh, in order to give mercy, you have to be close to the broken. I'm going to repeat that. In order to give mercy, you have to be close to the broken. Who are the broken? We're beginning with you, okay? But now we're also going to begin with somebody else because here's the idea. 
you don't want to just take the mercy of Jesus and praise His name, which you need to do. Thank Him for the mercy. You know, lift up His name. Worship Him. You and I, we need to do that. But that's not where it stops. We then, because we've received mercy, we go and we give it. So what do we need to do? Answer is easy. Find someone broken. Find someone hurting. Find someone who is in need of compassion, steadfast love, care. And show them the mercy that Jesus has shown you. James chapter 2 and verse 13 says this. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. But look at this next phrase. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Don't you think it did there? I do. I think there's a lot of cases in our life where there's people who are really struggling. And it's so easy, again, just to point our finger right at them. But does that really do anything? Does it solve anything? Does it make you feel better? You know, you're not as bad off as they are, at least at this moment. Is that all that it really does? I think that's about all that it really does. But the moment that you say, I'm going to come alongside of you and help you, and I'm going to show you mercy because I've been shown mercy before, then it says here that mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus chose not to judge, not to condemn, but to have mercy. And now 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this story. Okay? This is what needs to happen. This is what needs to be done. Zechariah, I want to take you to this passage. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments. Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. This is spoken of throughout all the Bible. This is the Old Testament. Speaking of having mercy and being like this. And I can show you verse after verse after verse after verse, but I want to take you to one more. It says in 1 Timothy, and I go to chapter 1, and I am going to read this section. It's a few verses here, and I'm only going to make a few comments about it, and we're done. Verse 12, I thank Him who has given me strength. This is Paul speaking. Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. I want you to put yourself in Paul's shoes as we read the rest of this, okay? Though formerly, Paul says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was insolent. I was an opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ, check this out, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Every one of us should be able to read those words. We can apply different things for blasphemer, different things for persecutor and insolent opponent. opponent. But either way, we put ourselves right there. You're the foremost. Verse 16, what does he do with it? But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. We'll stop there. Jesus Christ was going to be displayed through Paul as Paul gave mercy to others. As Paul gave what was given to him, what was given to him, the fact that all of his sins, everything he'd ever done wrong, he would be considered an enemy to God and God should rightly judge him, but chose to mercifully save him. And everybody who's here right now should be able to say the exact same thing. He mercifully saved you and brought you here to worship him in this day today. But now he asks you to display his mercy to other people. So is His mercy being displayed through you to somebody right now? Maybe, maybe not. Who is it? Or maybe should I say, who's it going to be? Be merciful, show mercy, give mercy, because mercy is what's been given to you through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for another day, and thank You for the opportunity we have to worship You. We thank You that You are good, Lord, that You're awesome. Yes, You have steadfast love and Lord, on top of that, you've given us a ministry of reconciliation. But today, as we looked at, you've given us mercy. This amazing gift that none of us here deserve. All of us are like this adulterous woman and in our own way. And whatever it is that we've done or committed. But Lord, in, in all those things, we realize that we need you. 
And without you, Lord, we are liable to judgment. And that is what we deserve and that is what we'll be given. But since we have you, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. And so God, we come before you now and ask you, that since you've been merciful to us, give us the strength that we need to show mercy to others in their time of need and to come close to those who are broken so we can live a life that exemplifies Jesus. Thank you for Hope Church. Thank you for everyone here. And may you be honored and glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Shepherds watch our King.